uh, the quality of the video was not uh, it was not in the level that we are expected, so we had to cancel it, unfortunately. But we may just want to touch upon this view of the International Anti-Corruption Court, if you want to, uh, you know, if you want to talk about it. I think uh, we will start with Casey on the on the definition of the grand corruption, and maybe uh, you could explain that, you know, why do you have those kind of definition differences like petty corruption and grand corruption, and and why you should, and, uh, it's not like we should uh, care more about grand corruption. What is the effect on our lives? And then we could uh, continue with the question uh, available legal instruments on the issue of grand corruption. Thank you, Barry. Uh, my name is Casey Hill, so I come from a background of Amnesty International, where I worked for 10 years uh, as a researcher and in the legal side of uh, working in, in Geneva, uh, human rights law. Uh, the cases of grand corruption that we're seeing, we use the word grand corruption. Uh, as Boya says, we at TI have been working on trying to distinguish from small scale or petty corruption, which is also impacts on poorer households, but does not impact on a widespread segment of the population. The definition that we've been looking at has been three parts. That it is a high level of entrusted power, whether that's as a corporate CEO or whether that is as a high level official. It is someone who has a great deal of power and uh, decision-making authority in private or public sectors. Second, then, is it involves a great deal of money, and there is a debate that goes on in the international legal community. This is a percentage of the gross domestic product. Should it be a fixed figure of a function of the poverty level? How do you set the amount so that you could say that it is a high enough amount that involves a great deal of money, but whatever the amount would be, and it's under debate, it's a large amount of money. It's not small or petty corruption, but it's a large amount. And the third is linked to human rights, that a new trend has been to approach corruption and ending corruption from a human rights-based approach. So linking that money and the withdrawing of that money, embezzlement, or the accepting of a bribe that should be gone to, to development actually has a widespread great impact on the human rights of citizenry in that country. So if there were supposed to be power generators built by If in Panama, the former president there stole money, almost 30 million out of a national assistance program, and that national assistance program was supposed to be feeding children, school children, hot meals or dehydrated food that could be reconstituted, and it was not received, or the food was adulterated with glass, which it was, or if it was spoiled, it was out of date by a year, then you could actually say there was an impact on the whole class of society. Children under the age of 10 who were in primary school and never got the dehydrated food or the school bags or some of the other things that were supposed to be given to children in Panama. So it's those three things. It's a high level of the, of the, the person deciding. It is the amount of money and TI yeah, is linking it to a human rights violation a widespread portion of the population. There's traditional cases. So in looking at uh, Mubarak or Yanukovych, the fourth president of Ukraine from 2010 to 2014, not only did he have police fire on demonstrators and kill 88 people in Kiev, but he also took out hundreds of millions of dollars and sold it away, allegedly, in the United Kingdom, in France, in Austria. And it's a number of different, very courageous Ukrainian NGOs that are trying to trace from documents as he fled the country in 2014, when he knew he was going to be arrested. 
he took all the documents and threw them into a pond in his uh, 140 hectare palatial estate. He had a pond. And the divers then went down and pulled out, the, and one by one they started pulling back and putting the papers back out and looking at 10,000 for flowers and uh, 100,000 to build a, uh, a, a fake galleon. He had his own ship created on his, his guard. It was saunas in a private zoo. And so it's that element of luxury, I think, that, that makes a lot of people look at grand corruption. But there's a new type. So there's all, also Petrobras, which is a company and then abused by a CEO or an organization that uh, it appears it's $3 billion worth of kickbacks that were done in a scheme over several years by the major Brazilian construction company. And not just in Brazil, but in certain other countries where TI chapters, Transparency International chapters, are now making access to information requests and trying to find out where were the other contracts and were they fulfilled and were the things, the dams and the bridges and the highways that were supposed to be built by this company, were they actually built? So we'll see how far that extends. But so far, it's five politicians indicted, 13 different com companies that are under suspicion. 117 indictments, and at least one person has come forward, uh, one of the highest officials who said, I took personally 100 million, and I'm willing to identify who else was involved in the scheme. So that's the extent. It's that there's amazing amounts of stories that seem to be coming out every day, whether it's HSBC or other large scale wrongdoing by companies or individuals. Just quickly to say the chronology then of what we did was uh, at Transparency International, it was actually our Sierra Leone chapter four years ago that brought up, we thought that, that he, he felt at our annual membership meeting, he brought up the idea, could you call corruption, grand corruption on that scale, a crime against humanity? And that launched a debate then for the next two years, is this so serious a crime that it should go to the International Criminal Court? We finally solved that question to say no, that torture, genocide, crimes against humanity were one set of grave human rights violations, and corruption, while grave and serious, was something else entirely that should not be in the International Criminal Court per se. It should be in its own separate. That's at least our judgment in terms of policy. Hence, there's discussions now of do we need an international anti corruption court? Do we need a global treaty then some sort of international mechanism? This international legal advisor has said a global treaty so that you can have uh, a way in which you would be able to prosecute people wherever they go as they cross borders. Finally, then we started looking at, uh, we gathered together uh, to start that definition to try to explore how would you actually create a law like that. We brought together some 20 experts in New York City. Uh, Akash Maharaj was at, at the table, along with Richard Goldstone, Louis Moreno Ocampo, the former International Criminal Court Prosecutor, the present chair of Transparency International, Jose Ugas, was the chair of the meeting. He was the former prosecutor in Peru that was hired by a president to look into wrongdoing by his head of secret police and then found that the president himself, the trail went right back up to the president, and he prosecuted the president himself and, and put the president in jail as well. So there, there's efforts to try to flesh out that definition to legal standard that could be adopted in Tunisia or could be adopted in Ukraine or situations of transitional justice. Finally, I think the international advocacy, just to touch on it, that 90% of the international criminal court cases do touch while they are human rights violations of a grave serious nature like torture or uh, recruitment of child soldiers, they all 90% interdivisibility between what we're seeing in criminal courts and that grand corruptionism. So we've worked with several different chapters of TI to put forward complaints at the international mechanism in Geneva, the UN human rights mechanisms in Venezuela or Maldives or Panama or Hungary. And finally, there's regional courts. So looking at a strategy of regional courts that could rule, 
the European uh, Economic Community, the ECOWAS, had ruled two years ago that there was a right to education that was infringed upon in Nigeria. And they actually found that there was a right to education that was not being fulfilled by the state. It's courts like that, then, that you could bring a similar case and say, having diverted money away from the public education budget or from the healthcare budget or the budgets to provide clean water, this head of state or this minister or this other high official. And as I say, we're looking forward to seeing them if there was an international criminal court or an international anti-corruption court or a, a treaty that would allow a global jurisdiction to pursue those who are crossing borders and salting money away. So it's a global issue of sorts as well. And I think I'll stop there to say that um, it's the asset recovery aspect. has gone from one country to three, four, five different shell companies that ends up in the United States, or ends up in Swiss bank accounts. How that money comes back from the proceeds of grand corruption, how it comes back to the country and is used in, to restitute the communities that are, have suffered the violations because of the lack of money for basic services. That's going to be the next really interesting part in international law, is making sure the funds come back and benefit the people we should have been better. So, thank you. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have to stand up because I have this presentation. Um, hello. Um, thank you very much, Oya. Thank you, Kesu. Uh, my name is Akash Maharaj. I am the um, CEO of the rather world leading global organization of parliamentary incidents. Um, so, to just to give you a very brief introduction to Gopal, um, its name is, <laughs> but it lacks an elegance it makes up for being self explanatory. We are a worldwide alliance of democratically elected legislators who have come together to combat corruption, um, strengthen democratic institutions, and uphold the rule of law. We have individual members of almost every country of the world and uh, full national chapters in 57 countries. And our members come from straight across the board. We have members who our members speak different languages, they pursue different political philosophies, they profess different faiths. Some of them have been in combat against one another during civil and international um, conflicts. They have quite literally been on opposite sides of history of warfare. But they do have all have one thing in common, and that is we are all united by a common conviction that that corruption has now become the single greatest threat to the security of nations, the development of societies, and to the rights of, of all mankind. Um, and we believe that it is up to parliamentarians as, as the elected representatives of the people to stand between our leaders and levels of power. Now, needless to say, parliamentarians are no less human than the people whom they represent. They are just as apt as the members of the general population to be part of the problem rather than part of the solution. And unlike the majority of people, they have access to a high level of power and a high level of resources, and therefore are subject to a high level of temptation. Um, that being the case, however, we do believe that parliamentarians must be part of the solution because absent parliamentarians playing this role, there is quite literally no one um, representing us standing between our leaders and the of power. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about corruption being a bad thing. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to be in this room right now if you didn't already believe that. But since we're talking about grand corruption, I do think it's important for us to get a, a, scale, a sense of scale of what we're talking about. Um, so the UNDP, the United Nations Development Program, estimates that for every dollar that the developing world receives, in a, it loses ten dollars to political corruption, um, often or almost always enabled by actors in the developing world. The World Bank estimated that the world annually loses a trillion dollars in bribes every year. The UN Office on Drugs and Crime 
estimates the world loses 2.1 trillion dollars every year uh, through illicit financial flows. And the Tax Justice Network estimates that every year the world loses 3.1 trillion dollars through tax evasion. Now this comes up to 6.2 trillion dollars, and that is to all intents and purposes a literally incomprehensible amount of money. I mean that literally. None of us can really understand what 6.2 trillion dollars means. But to try to put that into context, um, I'm sure everyone here is familiar with the UN Millennium Development Goals. They were proposed uh, towards the end of the 20th century. The deadline for achieving them was 2015. Um, we will not, we have not achieved them, and they are going to be replaced by a series of other goals called the Sustainable Development Goals. However, the UN Development the Millennium Development Goal included ending extreme hunger and poverty and bringing in universal primary education and promoting gender equity in schools and the workforce and reducing child mortality by two thirds and reducing maternal mortality by three quarters and halting the spread of HIV and malaria and promoting environmental sustainability and cutting in half the proportion of people have access to clean water sanitation. And the total cost of achieving all of these goals was estimated by the UN to be roughly $481 billion, less than half a trillion dollars. In other words, what the world loses to corruption in a single year would have been enough to achieve all of the Millennium Development Goals 12 times over. Uh, we could have achieved all of these goals every 30 days for what we lose in corruption. And I think that should give us pause about what we are fighting against. To achieve any one of these goals would be to change the human condition. To achieve all of them would be to fundamentally alter and transform what it means to be a human being. It would revolutionize not just human civilization, but it would change the nature of the human species itself. And we could have achieved all of those 12 times over for, for what we lose to corruption in a single year, every year. Now, the reason why at GoPak we believe that grand corruption merits special attention is the simple reason that there, we believe that there really are some forms of corruption so great um, whose effects on human life, human welfare, um, and human rights are so catastrophic that they should shock the conscience of the international community and mobilize the will of nations who act across borders. And the terrible irony is that the people who commit the most serious acts of corruption, the, the kind that Casey was referring to as grand corruption, they are always the least likely to be brought to justice because they are able, um, they, they would be unable to commit their acts of grand corruption if they did not first subvert the national institutions we should be holding them to account. In other words, ordinary criminals break their country's laws. The worst criminals make their country's laws. And therefore, the, the tools that we use to bring uh, perpetrators of grand corruption must be different from the tools we use to bring ordinary criminals of justice, not just in their muscularity, but in their very nature. Um, so in 2013, um, our alliance of parliamentarians met for our biennial uh, conference in the middle of the Philippines. Um, it was the largest anti, single largest anti-corruption gathering of parliamentarians in history. There were 700 uh, people at that conference. And they voted unanimously to go back to seek to make run corruption a crime of international law. And when I say unanimously, I, I cannot overstate what a, um, a telling decision that was. That included parliamentarians from Russia and Ukraine, from India and Pakistan, from Sudan and from South Sudan, countries who have a history of agreeing on absolutely nothing, yet they weren't able to agree on this. And I think that is, a, that is an indication of the amount of political will, the amount of popular will that exists in the world in the sense that we simply cannot go on the way we have been. The full declaration that was passed in 2013 is on our website. It's, it's very long, so I will read out the entire thing. But the operative passage 
is the one I put up here. Then we resolve to encourage states, the UN, and international institutions to deem crime, crimes of random corruption as crimes against the common community of humanity in violation of peremptory norms in international law. In other words, we believe that random corruption should be considered a crime everywhere, irrespective of who commits it, irrespective of the jurisdiction in which it is committed. There should be no laws, no legal instruments behind which someone who has committed these crimes can hide. The question, however, for us is then how does one move from the high principle of wanting to bring the perpetrators of ground corruption to justice to the actual difficult business of laying hold of them um, and, and bringing them to justice? We are pursuing a series of parallel streams, and I'll speak about them, each one of them very briefly. Um, the first is the use of universal jurisdiction. In short, universal jurisdiction is, is believed based on the belief that there are some crimes that are so serious that they are an affront to all human beings everywhere in the world. And it becomes not just the right, but indeed the responsibility of every country on the planet if they are able to lay hold of these people to bring them to justice. The, um, there is a strong legal question for this in the approach towards war crimes. Um, there has been a consensus since the Nuremberg trials that all countries have an obligation as well as a right to prosecute crimes against humanity and specifically crimes in violation of the laws of war. There are 78 countries that have explicitly placed um, universal jurisdiction on their books to, uh, to combat war crimes. And this is what we believe to be one of the most promising avenues, especially for ourselves, as a to go back as an, an alliance of national legislators. I do have to say that there are weaknesses to this approach. Um, and that again is, is uh, displayed in the historical example of war crimes. Of the 78 countries who have anti war crimes legislation on their books, only 15 have ever made any attempt to actually apply those things. In essence, uh, their, their reach often exceeds their grasp. And probably the best example of this is the Pinochet case. Um, Augusto Pinochet, the dictator of Chile, was indicted by a Spanish court while he was in the United Kingdom for crimes against humanity and war crimes um, against the people of Chile. Um, by all legal precedents, the government of the United Kingdom should have extradited him to Spain to face, to face trial for his crimes. But they evaded their responsibility by saying that they felt that he was too ill to face, to face justice in Spain. It was not, however, too ill to fly home to Chile and have a big party about um, this crime for the European justice. The second uh, part that we're looking at is, Casey mentioned, the use of regional courts. Um, regional courts, as transnational institutions, often have far more credibility with nations who subscribe to them than genuinely global organizations. They are more culturally sensitive, they're more culturally, um, locally situated. They don't tend to suffer from the accusations that global institutions have of cultural imperialism or one region trying to impose its values or its processes on another. And there is um, a precedent for trying grand corruption in, in at least one regional court. Uh, the East African uh, East African court, sorry, the, the Economic Community of West African States Community Court of Justice. That's a bit of a mouthful, I always love their name. Um, they explicitly recognized that um, that economic crimes, crimes of grand corruption, can be crimes against the human rights of populations, and accepted a uh, case, a specific case, against the government of Nigeria in defiance of that government's protestations that the court had no jurisdiction over grand corruption. Uh, we are working with our national chapters in Africa, and we are in particular working with our national chapters in Latin America on the possibility of setting up an explicit regional a court in, in Latin America explicitly for the purposes of trying ground corruption. Once again, there are weaknesses to regional courts. Most of the world is not covered by regional courts, especially particularly in, in Asia. And the increased relevance of regional courts has to be balanced against their decreased weight and decreased power. In the case of, of the courts, some 60% of their judgments have gone unenforced because they do not have the capacity to compel, um, to compel suspects to present themselves or compel states to punish people who have been convicted. 
The third group is the is the international court or some form of global court. Um, I have to say, if the if the international criminal court didn't exist, I suspect that I and many people like me would be spending our time right now trying to create it. The ICC is the stuff of high romance, the idea of a truly um, world-embracing institution that symbolizes basic standards of human decency and serves as a court of final, a final appeal for all peoples everywhere. Um, in service, the ICC labors under the greatness of that mandate. For the past 12 years, it has only secured two convictions. Uh, and the Rome Statute, which gives form to the ICC, makes no reference whatsoever to corruption. Um, as a result, it would be a difficult case to make to say that the ICC should, from a, from a, a legal perspective, it would be diff a difficult case to argue that the ICC should try um, cases of grand corruption. From a practical perspective, they have such difficulty with their existing mandate, I doubt very much that they could bear an expanded mandate in any direction. Um, Judge Will, unfortunately, could not be here today, has proposed the creation of a new freestanding anti corruption court. Um, he is uh, a federal judge in the United States. I think it's fair to say that his proposal has captured the imagination of people around the world. It would be an ideal solution to um, trying grand function. Again, I think one must be aware of the inherent difficulties in creating, in creating an entirely new institution. I'll say very briefly, the idea of crimes against humanity. GOPAC does believe that it is a point of difference between GOPAC and Transparency International, but we do believe that, that crimes of grand corruption, when they rise to a level that they cause catastrophic loss of human life, are in fact crimes against humanity. Um, we estimate that every year, grand corruption and corruption kills 140,000 children by depriving them of food, water, and medical care. If there were a group of people who gunned down 140,000 children, none of us would have any hesitation in saying that those people have committed a crime against humanity. Those children are just as dead because they were killed by corruption instead of by bullets. And we feel that the people who are responsible are just as guilty of crimes against humanity. Um, again, the weakness to this is not everyone agrees with us. Um, the, it, is, uh, it is a case that we are comfortable of comfortable in making. Um, to be fair, it, crimes of um, grand corruption often lack the mens rea, that is to say, the people who commit them rarely set out to kill large numbers of people. They simply kill those people recklessly or indifferently, but they're interested in the money. They are uninterested in the lives that they cost. And finally, um, the use of civil remedies. Um, this is a, a, a path that we are pursuing with our colleagues in the United States. Uh, are there any Americans in the room? That is very telling. Um, <laughs> um, the only thing my American friends love more than their country is the prospect of suing other people. And that makes the United States uh, an ideal venue for civil actions against kleptocrats. Um, we are preparing a case against a specific kleptocrat in New York State on the grounds that he has secreted um, much of his wealth in Manhattan real estate. Um, unlike liquid assets, it's very difficult to move a condominium or an office building at the, at the touch of a button. Um, and the fact that his assets are in New York State means that the New York courts are jurisdictional. Moreover, there is a well-established um, case law for suing people for, for um, stealing from, from individuals as well as stealing from from entire government. The downside to this process, 98% of all civil actions brought before the New York bar never get to the courthouse. They are settled or abandoned before they reach the court, and the, the ethics of settling with the kleptocrat are to put it mildly troubling. Um, what I would say is that all the paths I have described have their strengths, all of them have their weaknesses, they all strike a different balance between the ideal and the feasible. But, and that is why we are pursuing all of those paths in tandem. There is no magic bullet to fighting grand corruption, but there is absolutely a moral and political imperative that we do fight grand corruption. 
no one of these is the is the solution, but we feel that collectively it, it will be the solution. Um, ultimately, the world is full of people who who um, will tell us that this can't be done, um, and the reason they tell us that this can't be done is that they don't want us to do anything. Um, all great actions start off in defiance of people who said that what you we were trying to do is impossible, but we believe that we must make this possible because this is the call of our time. It is difficult to look ourselves in the, in the eye um, or to look ourselves in the mirror knowing the great trauma that is done to our, to our species as a result of land corruption. I do not think that we would be able to hold our heads high before the judgment of history if we did not say that we were going to seize this moment in history, take advantage of the political will, and actually act against that but there's one thing that I, I have learned from our national chapters, particularly in the Arab states and the post-revolutionary post context, it's that kleptocrats always seem invincible until they're not. Uh, every one of those kleptocrats was brought down in those revolutions seemed invincible until the people decided that they had enough. I think I think that collectively around the world, people have had enough. And if there were ever a time to succeed, it is now. Thank you. Um, was a very inspiring uh, ending. It was a very important uh, speech as well. Um, I will get questions from the audience. But I just want to ask uh, Casey one question. Um, why grand corruption in the uh, C20 community? Why should uh, G20 about the, the grand corruption. What do you think? It's a good question because in trying to think about either a court as Judge Wolf has proposed in the United States or a global treaty, the question is why would any government want to do that when the next the sitting president could go out of power and then also be prosecuted? So there's that question of what would motivate a government to do that sort of uh, step. I think, though, that one of the most exciting things that's developed in the last uh, three or four weeks, a request came to our chapter in the United Kingdom from Cameron. It was uh, it literally they said it's number 10 down in state form. We're thinking of actually proposing some sort of major solution on uh, corruption. What do you think? Uh, and the motivation that was explained to us for David Cameron wanting to do this as Prime Minister was that it was a recognition of the Tabo and Becky panel that found that there were so many flows that were coming out of Africa that it was no longer sustainable, that development for an entire continent was being compromised, and that in the foreseeable future, as climate change got worse, as it was harder and harder to convince to increase the amount of development flows, that there was a lot of money that was already there in, in, in the continent of Africa that was already leaving that continent and being put into his bank, bank accounts in London and that he wanted to stop it because he felt personally responsible or responsible as the, the government of the United Kingdom that they were receiving the proceeds of corruption in hundreds of millions if not billions of dollars. So it was it was quite a moving moment that, that this what fuels Westminster and the city of finance, a global hub, is the ill-gotten gains that have been looted from people in a different country. So I, I think that there is a motivation as well as a recognition that development cannot move forward unless you actually stop these illicit financial flows. Can I ask you the same question? Um, I, I guess embedded in a question are two questions. First of all, why should, why should the um, G20 make this de declaration? And why would the G20 make this declaration? Um, the one that should, I, I think, is fairly obvious, as Casey's pointed out, because grand corruption causes so much harm across the world. It is, it is an outrage against human decency. But the question, why would they do that? Um, I think it's twofold. First, uh, many of the other objectives of the G20 pursues, economic, um, defense, and otherwise, they cannot be, we've now reached a point where we are rubbing up against the limitations caused by corruption. We cannot achieve our economic objectives, nor can we create a world that is secure and stable. And 
unless we do something about the corruption. And indeed, if there is an obscenity about, the obscenity about grant corruption, are all the things that we could be doing with that money that we are unable to do because they are being um, squirreled away by collective grants. But from a more practical perspective, I mean, why would politicians, who are just as self-interested as any other actor, why would they want to do something about this? And um, I'm not going to hold my breath and wait for the day when the world is governed by angels, because I suspect I'd be holding my breath a very long time. The trick to democracy is never is not waiting for better people. It is creating incentives so that good people and bad people choose to do the right thing because it is in their interest. Um, until a couple of years ago, the BBC ran a, a global survey about one of the most discussed subjects around the world. Um, and for the last three years, the single most discussed subject on the planet um, wasn't religion, it wasn't politics, it wasn't jobs in the economy, it was corruption um, across different linguistic groups, across different continents. Um, it, has, it has corruption and an awareness of corruption is bubbling over all around the world. And I think that we've reached a junction in history where self-interested political actors have realized that, first of all, um, their grip on power will loosen unless they are seen to be doing something about corruption. And second, the other political actors will understand there is an opportunity for them to achieve power by being seen to be doing the right thing against corruption. Um, I think that combination of factors means that we are in a junction in history where the time is right for action against corruption. One of the things that that we as, as a civil society can do is not just tell governments that this is the right thing to do, they already know it's the right thing to do, but to persuade governments that it is in their interest to do it. I'd like your answer actually on why would they want to do this. I guess the other issue is that the time is now is looking to the jurisdiction. The OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, studied 400 cases of foreign bribery and they found that it was not a south, southern issue or a northern issue that one fifth of the bribes paid one fifth of the, of the average bribe was 13 million dollars it was paid to developing countries so it was in the organization of economic cooperation and development this is their own study that looked at it and that 12 percent of the bribes were actually authorized by the ceo of the multinational company it was not just some rogue person down at the, at the lower level in the company office somewhere in Africa. It was the CEO sitting in Paris or New York or wherever that was authorizing this bribe. So I think it's it's an issue also that seems to cross the North South split. That it is a recognition that the problem is on both sides, but it's quite a dangerous problem. Okay, great. Please, questions? Yeah, I My name is Delan Korkut from the uh, Civil Society Development Center in Turkey. Um, could you uh, give us your uh, observations or information on the uh, relation between uh, democracy and corruption? Uh, how to be democratic affects uh, corruption or how non-democracy creates uh, this so if, if you have data available. And I know my significant so you partly answered uh, the link between multinationals and corruption. Uh, is that it can we develop a specific tool uh, to prevent uh, this type of corruption? Any other questions? I will try to ask the question, but I don't know if I will be able to tell a higher time right now. Uh, but I will try at least. Firstly, it was really inspiring all of your thoughts. Uh, first of all, uh, the mention about the UNDP specific about the AIDS. It's so important because today we just added a sentence regarding the humanitarian aid uh, 
the anti-corruption relation. Maybe it should be another uh, recommendation on the community, separate one. I don't know, we might be discussing that because it's so important. Uh, secondly, uh, Kelsey, Kelsey, Kelsey mentioned regarding the uh, corruption and uh, human rights violation because we did Oyanam and everyone tried so hard, tried really so hard to add uh, ICC to the 10th C20 committee or the police paper, but we really couldn't do that because technically it's so hard. Rome Statute is uh, so clearly and open about the uh, crime community and uh, it needs really hard political will to be able to do that. So, uh, but the mention of Kelsey about people that uh, do actions against humanity, also the ones that are corrupt. That's, I think, very important to mention and we, I think we should be going on that, making maybe some statistics about people that are corrupt, also that are uh, uh, acting against corruption. That's also I will be working later. Uh, but uh, I will ask a difficult question. Right now, okay, ICC is important and the regional course also so important, but as far as I observe, we are really at the beginning of that challenge. Right now, even when you ask people about grant corruption, they don't know what it is. Really, at the very beginning of the process. So, this year we tried to add no impunity to that OCP papers, and it's so important because you told that uh, Rome study makes no explicit mention of corruption, but it makes explicit mention of no impunity. So it's so important, the step-by-step -step process. But my question, what the next step should be? What can the society do to persuade more the governments? Any other question? Yes, uh, thank you. My name is Angela Weitner. I'm from Transparency Germany. Um, I'm not so high on the uh, ICC because I've lived in Kenya and I've um, followed what happened uh, in Kenya by trying to bring people to justice before the ICC. Um, but uh, now I'm more enthusiastic about the civil measures and uh, I think this is something that uh, you know countries like Germany could be uh, maybe more active in what uh, what can we do within our own countries and within Berlin surely some of the apartments and the houses that have been bought in Berlin must have been bought with money stemming from corruption isn't that so so what uh, uh, what can we do uh, the uh, German system is different from the U.S. system so if you feel and if you, if you know, and if you want to sue in New York, you have to settle. I don't think uh, that fear is as high in Germany because our laws are are different. Uh, um, so, uh, but I still think it's um, it's it would be difficult to institute an action. And could you uh, maybe explain what would be needed in? In a country like uh, like Germany, to you know, pursue the asset that house that was built with money from whoever. Thank you. Okay, if there is no other question, let's start. Um, um, that is a lot of, <laughs> a lot of big questions. Um, the connection between democracy and corruption. I I think there is absolutely. There's absolutely a, a connection there, and that is um, concentrations of power always, concentrations of power don't just invite uh, corruption, they make corruption inevitable. Um, democracies are by no means proof against corruption, but the advantage that they have again over totalitarian systems is that democracies, genuine democracies, as opposed to cosmetic democracies, always have some diffusion of power. And it is that diffusion of power that increases the risk of getting caught um, and reduces the, the propensity for people to commit, um, to, to commit acts of grand corruption. Um, by contrast, I would, I would take China as an example. Um, in terms of political corruption, um, the country with the largest number of billionaires, and that's billionaire with a B, 
in its national legislature is China. China has 80 billionaires sitting as parliamentarians in their legislature. And I can tell you, they didn't become billionaires through their salaries as MPs. Um, it is because of the massive concentration of power in that system, a country of 1.4 billion people that is for all intents and purposes governed by a public bureau standing committee of seven people. Um, it is inconceivable that corruption would not, would not flourish under those circumstances. Conversely, however, democracies have a different kind of vulnerability to corruption, and that is they can become um, victims of endemic corruption when the population comes to believe that there is so little chance of a system of integrity that instead of instead of the population demanding an end to corruption, the population starts demanding our turn of the trough. And I've seen that in many, many countries, and that, that can be a death spiral for democracy because, in effect, even honest political, and that, under those circumstances, honest political actors, people who actually want to do the right thing, cannot get elected because the populations, their home constituencies, expect them to bring home some of the spoils of victory because last time the other group in society got some of that spoils. And I think that is the most difficult question to answer for democracy. Not how do you change the laws, but how do you change the social norms so that there is a national intolerance of corruption? Um, that kind of cultural change is the most difficult to achieve, but it is also the most important to achieve, in, in, in my view. Um, on the question about multinationals, um, absolutely, multinationals um, have a special role. In, in the past, there's been a sense of the international system, be it political or economic, was governed by the laws of the jungle, whereas national states had national laws, national legal codes, and a national rule of law. The international system has, for centuries, been governed by, um, to use Thucydides' phrase, a place where the strong do what they can and the weak endure what they must. Um, but in a world where increasingly economic activity is governed by transnational entities called individuals and corporations, we cannot afford to allow that to continue. Um, so there has to be a system of the rule of law in the international system. And there also has to be a political willingness of national government not to engage in a race to the bottom. In other words, not to say, well, we have to weaken our laws that govern corruption in in international businesses, because if we don't, our companies will be at a competitive disadvantage. Every company makes that, that argument, it is a lie. Um, increasing standards both domestically are good for companies in the long term. It might be painful in the short term, but if you think that you can, if you think that you can only make money by stealing and being corrupt, then frankly you're not a very good business person. Um, on the question of the international sort of on being at the beginning of, um, of the challenge of for grand corruption. You're right, um, the language of attacking grand corruption as grand corruption is relatively new, uh, but I think that we have an advantage over efforts that have, have gone in the past for others, other global movements, and that is, for, anyone, for any of us who are trying to achieve things on the international stage, one of the challenges that we rub up against is cultural relativism. People saying, well, that might be fine over there, but it's not fine over here. Um, that is not consistent with our values, with our practices. There is no religion anywhere in the world that says, where it says it's okay to steal. There is no culture anywhere in the world that says it's all right to steal or, or to commit fraud. Um, moral revulsion against corruption is one is is a universal cultural phenomenon. And that means for those of us who are fighting corruption, we start off with a huge advantage. Um, that, now, that's not to say that there aren't cultural minds and point trips over, but the basic idea that we have to, we can't let them get away with it, that is something that everyone understands everywhere in the world. Um, on the question of next steps around um, civil actions, I'll take those two questions together. Um, or what are the next steps in fighting corruption? Um, the, the most direct route is through national, is through national activism. That's why I believe that, that universal jurisdiction is the first port of call. Um, it's not going to be waterproof because there will always be some countries that refuse to pass those laws. But we don't need to get all the countries in the world to pass universal jurisdiction. We just need to get some of them and then to go through those courts. Um, again, not to get all of the 
democratic plans around the world, but to get the worst plastic plans and to put the worst ones behind bar, bars and make the rest of them very, very afraid. Um, and finally, what about civil measures? Um, what needs to happen to bring someone to, to bring a civil action against someone? It, it varies a little bit from legal system to legal system, but the basic elements are the same everywhere. You need to have someone who you can demonstrate has stolen the money. You need to be able to show that the assets that you can point to are the proceeds of his or her crime. And lastly, and strangely, this can be the most difficult one, you need to have a complainant. That is to say, you need to be able to point to a person or to a group of people and say, this person is going to sue that kind of crime because this person was directly harmed by the action of that kind of crime. And that would be surprisingly difficult. Um, if I steal five dollars from you, I'm still in your five dollars. If I steal a billion dollars from your from your country, I'm still in your money. But it becomes more difficult to prove that I'm still in your money than you have less money. Possible, not impossible, but difficult. Um, I can I can't tell you who we're going after in our case in New York State. I hope you'll find out in 2016. But I will say that we have chosen our first target very carefully. We've chosen someone who we feel. Um, his money can't flee. We've chosen someone where we believe he has committed crimes in multiple jurisdictions and the government's schools multiple jurisdictions will collaborate with us um, in bringing in, in bringing evidence, evidence against him. Not because they're a good and virtuous government, but because he has pissed off some of his former co-conspirators and they feel they, they, they feel that they were cheated by the chief. Um, and finally, because we feel that his assets are fixed in real estate and that he won't, he won't be able to, unlike liquid assets, he won't be able to move them around at a, at a textual button. So when I say the last one, probably the most important one from a political perspective, he's an absolutely odious human being. We needed to find someone who everyone would hate and would have no allies whatsoever. So when we brought him down, he would create a money. Just a question, are there any um, lawyers in the audience? Oh, good. Okay, one or two. Great. Is that um, I am not a lawyer. I've studied law um, for a number of years, but I didn't qualify for bar. But I found that it's a lot of excitement. Actually, that law is actually rather a, 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 a contentious, wrangling, uh, confrontational sport sometimes. So the first uh, answer I wanted to say was we talk about the Rome statutes and the asked about. What about the International Criminal Court? And to say it's not on a legal basis that we disagree on crimes against humanity and going to that International Criminal Court. It's that we already had the debate in Transparency International. We have over 100 chapters. And I was the one that was the chair that had to watch half the lawyers of Transparency International say, yes, let's go and call it a crime against humanity. And the other half say, no. This is only reserved for torture and genocide, and you're keeping out genocide in Rwanda. We call so it's actually theoretically possible and legally possible to talk about crimes against humanity, but you get to such wrangling between uh, legal definition that it was. We decided to sidestep the question, <laughs> and so braver souls and more more adventurous people can try it in the short term. In the longer term, that might be a possibility, but in the short term, and it's it's. More difficult to try to open up that home statute with the international criminal court. The second was uh, as we embarked on this uh, discussion, we looked at 32 different cases of brain corruption. Uh, and the, the idea that you mentioned, Bob, that of uh, no impunity, is quite central to this that we try to see what were the obstacles of why weren't people brought to justice. And the main thing, that I like Akash's quote, that most criminals break their country's laws, but a few high-level criminals make their country's laws. And that's what we found was there was interference in the prosecution. There was interference in the judges. There was interference then in serving the actual sentence to get the fine paid that there was political interference at the very highest levels. And that was the creation of impunity. In part, then, we just came from, uh, from Malaysia, where the, as it was referred to in the last session, uh, we were talking about the prime minister that had uh, a huge donation put into his own personal bank account. And when it was uncovered by the prosecutor, he was fired. 
when the special police investigator that investigated corruption spoke out and said it was going to be a fair and transparent investigation, he was fired and relieved of duty. So that interference is the thing that really generates uh, a lot of the outrage about, about brand corruption, I think. The last part was just on uh, the measures or what sort of special tools of suppression. How would you, what tools would you use? In the declaration, if you're going to look at that declaration, it's very important for us, I think, in the anti-corruption working group to talk about asset declarations, in part because you have then the way in which you try to prove that. Uh, you have to, as the class says, you have to prove that this is the proceeds of corruption. The only way to do that is to have an asset declaration and say, wait a second, this, this man as a member of the Duma in Russia, he made Sixty or a hundred thousand dollars, when he owns a million dollar uh, property in Dubai. Well, how does that happen? So you can start comparing a lifestyle check, and that's where civil society comes in. You check the lifestyle, you see the house, and you compare it to the actual state and salary. The other is the beneficial ownership transparency. It's a mouthful, but I prefer the title anonymous shell companies that there's a shelving that goes on, that the money is bounced from three, four, five different places. It's called layering between one corporate entity that holds on to a second corporate entity to a third corporate vehicle. And by the time it goes through four or five times, nobody, no law enforcement, whether it's in the UK or in Kenya or anywhere else, can actually go three or four, five, six steps back. It's almost impossible. It can be done, but it takes a lot of effort. So that's that together happens to try to both prove that there was a crime of corruption, but then to actually trace it through the labyrinth of all these different anonymous show companies takes a great deal of, of, of energy and time and money and resources to trace it back to who is actually the human person that is taking that money and investing it in the property. So the, those are the two the tools, as asset declarations and beneficial ownership transparency, those registers to figure out Who's the actual human person that, that owns us? Great, thank you. I mean, uh, you're familiar with those scenes, the, uh, the corrupt people take it all over the world. I think they're not quite creative, they pr probably do them um, in a similar, uh, similar, they probably act as a similar parents. And uh, you know, I mentioned that the donation and gift, uh, and then you have also. Uh, made a reference on it, but uh, the pattern over there that you see, as soon as there is an allegation, then you start uh, you start firing the prosecutors, and then because you also control the uh, judiciary, and uh, we are also familiar with those kind of patterns in Turkey that happened. Uh, you may not you may remember that last two years that there was a corruption scandal, and and uh, we finally end up prosecuting the prosecutor. Very ridiculous things, I guess, but I think it's going to go into the history of the corruption. Another, uh, another example. And if we have another question. We could answer it. We have like a couple of more minutes. And if you don't, we could then call it to an end. Okay. Just maybe a short uh, not question but uh, comment on uh, this um, ICC. I think it is meaningless uh, to put many functions to that court uh, instead of uh, uh, enlarging the, its mission uh, maybe it is much more reasonable uh, to initiate uh, a new court uh, system or uh, at regional or, or international level, uh, a new system, a totally new system for only corruption. Mm -hmm. Because ICC, uh, both financially and uh, uh, politically, uh, they passing through a very difficult time. Uh, it, it, its workload is uh, really much. Uh, Instead of uh, doing this, we should find another way uh, to solve the issue. This is my view. No, I, I think that that's a, a, a commonly felt uh, uh, sentiment that three things that 
One was that we had very strong human rights leaders from Amnesty or Human Rights Watch or else that said, if you try to open up the Rome Statute again, there's a lot of countries that would never want to have the International Criminal Court ever pass. And if you open it up, they're immediately going to try to undercut a lot of things. So don't open up the mandate of, of that, that court because you find it's actually going to get cut at the knees if there's a political opening because nobody likes it now because they can see that there's a, there, there is a political accountability for human rights violations. But there's a lot to be done anyway around the International Criminal Court that as an aggravating circumstance when you're sentencing someone or when you're judging admissibility to say that this grand corruption was a factor in the crimes committed by someone. There's a lot of different ways that grand corruption could come into the picture without having to, to, to charge a person with that charge. You can use it in sentencing or in admitting the gravity of the crime and admitting that case and making sure that that's a priority to say there's one case here where someone has stolen so much money that there's a clear evidence that the money is gone and that they, the population has suffered. So I think there's other ways to use that criminal court without having to formally open it up and expand it up. Um, I just wanted to get your opinion on the asset declaration. You, you said this is a big, uh, huge tool. But we have so many, uh, I mean, how far will it go? We have so many civil servants. Uh, we know the assets of everyone. What, what, uh, you know, what's uh, the sentiment? Are we going to, uh, to get all the G20 countries to um, you know, open, uh, uh, have all the civil servants declare their assets? Uh, is, is that what you want, or would you just say that the high, at the highest level, or um, and uh, with that, and, and that would then be public? Um, I think there's, there's already a precedent for this in the banking system, and that is there's the concept of a politically exposed person where uh, banks already have to take special measures to verify the identity and the source of funds of people who have um, a particular level of power and influence that could lead to um, a reasonable person to feel that there's an elevated risk for that, that their money is, is illicit. I think similar standards can be applied for asset declaration of people. The kind of people who qualify for politically exposed person status would also qualify for to have asset declaration required of them. But I, I think one of the there are lots of countries that have things called asset declarations, but I don't wouldn't say are worthy of that term. It's not really an asset declaration. If tree falls in the forest and, and, and no one's there, does it make a sound? If you make an asset declaration and it's sealed in an envelope and no one ever sees it, is that an asset declaration? No, it's not. Um, so an asset declaration should affect the, the more senior people, it should be public, um, and it should be inspectable by by the population at large. And another reason, I, I do I think we all agree that people do have certain rights to privacy. I think the lower down in the, the, the political food chain you go, the, the greater your legitimate expectation of privacy, the higher up you go, the lower your legitimate expectation of privacy. Um, just, I mean, just as a footnote is to say that we looked at some 25 or 30 different cases. The question of Hosni Mubarak, the former president of Egypt, uh, he can rightly say through his lawyer, he does not have any money abroad. It's been demonstrated that he has four billion, his family has four billion abroad, but you cannot figure out where it is, or you know that his son has it, but it cannot be traced to a predicate crime of uh, corruption. So in part, the only way to do that, the only way that you'd be able to, had there been an asset declaration, and you match up the several different homes that are said that are alleged to be owned by the Mubarak family in London. And then you look at 
what has he declared as his income? That's the only way that you can do that because Hosni Mubarak will never be brought to justice. Never. Because there's never been a crime proven against him. He cannot say that those houses are owned where the proceeds of corruption. So there's no way to hold that man to justice unless that comes to the point where you can say, this was the money that was, should have been in the state coffers, but it can't be proven. And the way to do that is an asset declaration. I, I would add one additional tool to that. Um, although it's not legal in all countries of the world, I think it ought to be. Um, it's part of the UN Convention Against Corruption. It's the unexplained wealth provisions. In other words, if you happen to have half a billion dollars sitting in an account, and you can't give an explanation for where that money came from, the state has a right to presume that it is the result of something that you don't want to talk about, and therefore the right to seize it. Um, I think that is a reason that is that is reasonable across the board. And indeed, many countries have in the Court of Chancery uh, exist, especially under tax law, existing um, laws along those lines. In other words, it is for the reasons that Casey pointed out, it can be difficult for a third party to establish where your money came from. But you know where your money came from because it's your money. And if you if you're not explaining where it came from, it's not because you can't explain where it came from. It's not because the tooth fairy came from and put a billion dollars under your pillow. It's because you don't want to explain where it came from. You don't want to explain where it came from because if you were to do so truthfully, they would take your money away from you. Um, that being the case, I'm a big believer that unexplained wealth should be a criminal, at, at least a civil offense. Well, I was thinking about asking you the corruption and uncheck um, measures, and uh, you explained it quite well. But for the last thing that you said, that unexplained well, I wonder, in, 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 is there any country in the world that um, ever uh, implemented this? this? Um, it, it, and it is indeed a, a requirement of the UN Convention Against Corruption. There are several countries, including my own, I am a Canadian, um, where the Canada is a signatory to the UN Convention Against Corruption, and it has refused to implement that part of it on the grounds that it believes it. The government of Canada asserts that it is a violation of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. If I were, if I were Prime Minister of Canada, I would put that to the test. Um, and certainly, there are other countries that there are many other countries that that, that, have, um, that, that have established the response. So I would say the real question is the is the willingness of countries, the political will, to to apply those laws. Are so widely, or war crimes are so widely accepted in national law, is that you should, there are very few political leaders who can imagine themselves ever committing a war crime. Every political leader can imagine himself committing a commercial crime. <laughs> <laughs> that's, actually, that's a great ending to this session to hear that there are at least some countries implementing those provisions. Uh, I thank you very much, both of you. Thank you. Uh, great uh, speeches and information provided for the audience.